All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Erin Wadsworth Anderson, and I'm an instructional designer in the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction at Utah State University. And you are in the hashtag teach, incorporating social media into our classrooms for maximum learning session. And Chris Oldroyd from Utah Valley University is going to take it away. I will um, go ahead and let her introduce herself and we'll go from there. Chris. Thank you. Not a lot to say about me. I'm a first year assistant professor in the psychology department at Utah Valley University and really passionate about meeting our students where they are, about trying to take our materials and our um, subject matter and help them apply it to their real life and um, take it outside of the classroom. And one of the best ways I found to do that is by using social media. So let's jump into that. We are teaching the world's first generation of digital natives, students who have literally grown up and with and on cell phones, computers, and the internet. If given the choice between reading a textbook or tweeting, these guys are going to choose to tweet every time. And because they've had access to social media from the day of their birth, I believe they have come to think about and process the world differently. Let me give you a brief example. One day my teenage daughter and I were driving in California when we came across a license plate with um, on a cool car. And I thought to myself, I have to remember to tell my husband this when I get home. And I immediately began mentally rehearsing the details of the car and the license plate so that I wouldn't forget. My teenage daughter, on the other hand, said, Mom, Mom, hurry and speed up to that car. I have to take a picture of it and post it on Snapchat so I don't forget. So our students are always thinking about their next post or their next tweet or their next YouTube video. And if these are the tools that they are using to remember and process information in their day-to-day -day lives, I think that we can harness the power of these apps to help students process and remember the information that we're giving them in our classrooms as well. So today I wanna to spend our first five to seven minutes together looking at what the research says about social media in the classroom. Then I wanna spend the rest of our time together giving you practical ideas for how you can use social media in your classroom as soon as tomorrow. So we're gonna look at the research together using an app called Snapchat. Snapchat is the number one social media platform for Gen Z. Three billion photos and videos are created every day. 78% of the users are between the ages of 15 and 24 and more than 10 billion video views are logged on Snapchat every day. Snappables are Snapchat games based on interactive lenses that overlay your camera. And one Snappable that I use in my courses quite a bit is called This or That. In this game, you present your audience with two choices and they get to vote. In the real world, our students use this filter to ask people to vote on which outfit they should wear to the football game on Saturday or which show they should binge watch next on Netflix. In my class, I use it as more of a true or false. Here are some examples, um, real life examples I pulled from my children's friends. In the first one, the girl wants to know which outfit she should wear. And the second one is supposed to be a fun way to spark conversation among friends. So again, I use it in my class as kind of a true false quiz. So I'm gonna put up a screen that looks like a snap I would send to my students. If we were live in a classroom, you would receive this picture on your phone. Okay, you would read the two statements. You would then drag the circle over the statement you thought was true and send the snap back to me. Since we don't have access to Snapchat today, we're gonna to use Zoom's stamp tool instead. So I'm going to put some instructions on how to use that tool in the chat. I am also going to walk you through it um, for those of you who may not have used it before. So putting those instructions in the chat and also walking you through. So if you scroll up to the top of your screen, you'll see a green bar that says you are viewing Chris Oldroyd's screen. Right next to that is a view options. Go ahead and click on that. Scroll down to the bottom where it says um, annotate. Is there an annotate for you guys? Did that get turned off, moderator? I'm sorry. 
the oh the annotate is not working okay yes it looks like it's turned off on your end okay let me see i made you the co-host so if you i apologize i'm not sure Um, Chris, do you know where to turn that on? Uh, I believe it's in your settings when you set it, when you set up the meeting. So um, we can okay. bypass that for now. If that's not turned on, I believe we would have to restart the meeting to do that. Okay. I'm sorry about that. They actually, <laughs> the, the ETE team set it up, so I'm not sure. No, it's fine. So we'll just go ahead. Typically, if you follow these instructions that are there in the chat, your students can um, click on annotate and they have access to all kinds of fun stamps. They have a star or a heart or a check mark, and they can then click on your screen and you can see what their vote is. So for this particular slide, go ahead and kind of mentally take a note of which one you believe to be the true statement, this or that. Okay, so in this case, the first option was true. Positivity, emotion, and play are at the heart of engaging students in our class. As we all know, student engagement is the raw material of learning. And research shows that we are 31% more productive when our brains are in a positive state than in a neutral or negative state. Let's do another one. This or that, take a minute and read there. If you wanna type your answer into the chat since we don't have stamp go ahead and do that you can say this or that yeah absolutely so it looks like everyone is responding to this social media creates a back door for shy students to speak up and participate in a lesson in so many classrooms, there are students who will not speak up. And allowing these students to engage with the material via social media apps that they're comfortable with, rather than forcing face-to-face -face engagement, gives them a voice and encourages them to speak up in a safe environment. Positive results in this setting may lead to more face-to-face -face participation later in the semester, once trust and collaboration among class members and with the teacher are established. As for social media serving as a distraction, research has found that the opposite is true. If a student's phone is on and open to your Twitter classroom page, it can't be on the student's individual Instagram page at the same time. So requiring real-time participation in an app prevents students from using other apps that might be distracting to them while in your class. Last one. Go ahead and read through those, this or that, put your answer in the chat. Mike, you need to make an actual decision this time, this or that. Okay, what research is showing here is that social learning enhances attention, retention, and motivation. Psychologist Albert Bandura's theory on social learning is simple. It says that social learning encourages interaction with others and facilitates learning in a way that comes naturally to most students. It also provides learners with greater control over their education and how to receive information. So again, Albert Bandura's theory tells us that Information learned while in a social context is 25% uh, more attainable when we go to pull it out a week later than information learned in a solo setting. So let's get to the nitty gritty, social media in the classroom, which apps do I use and how do I use them? I have five go-to apps. They are Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. I hope we'll be able to get to all of them today. 
The first one is Snapchat, which we've used a little bit with the snappable this or that. Another way I like to use Snapchat is to gauge student understanding. We have all had the experience of asking, does anyone have any questions about the material? And then staring into a sea of blank faces and hitting a wall of silence. As teachers, we really need to know if our students understand what we've covered and if we can go on. And we need to know if we need to do a review or if we can start giving new information. Snapchat lets me get honest answers in real time when I ask the question, does anyone have any questions? This is how I do it. I ask students, how are you feeling about the content we just learned? On our class Snapchat channel, send me a selfie letting me know. Students then pull out their phones, aim their cameras at their own faces, and within just a couple of seconds, the answers start pouring in. Students take a picture letting me know how they feel and send it to me. Their answer is quick, confidential, and quiet. No one knows how they answered, so they don't risk being the only person to say, I don't get it. Once I receive a number of snaps, I have a pretty good idea of how the class is feeling and if I need to review or if it's safe for me to move on. Another option is to ask students, send me a picture of the slide from this presentation that was most confusing to you. If a large section of the class sends me a picture of the same slide, I know that I need to go back and review that material before moving on. So those are my favorite ways to use Snapchat. The second social media platform I wanna to talk to today is Instagram. I'm gonna show a quick 90 second video of teams explaining what Instagram is and how they use it. While you watch, I want you to be thinking about what Instagram offers our students. What are they getting out of it? Why do they like it so much? 90 seconds to find out what it is and why they like it so much. What are they getting out of it? Instagram is essentially a uh, social media site where you, uh, you take pictures and you kind of share them with the world. You can have a public account, you can have a private account. Um, and that's so important because on a public account, literally anyone can follow you. There's like wide variety of different hashtags that like you would search for like to get kind of follow like kind of find your um niche yeah. uh, like so I I I'd be like crazy into surfing so I like all my news feed will be like different surfing surfers. events or surfers. I think it is a little bit more different. Like I think boys can get away with like putting up photos of sports and stuff. Girls, it's maybe you're more focused on it. Definitely how you look. Like you have a very manufactured look, like you're looking at people like celebrities like Taylor Swift and Nicki Minaj and all these like perfect women, I suppose. And you are trying to tailor your body to that. And then you're trying to wear clothes like them. You're very influenced like by the fashion world. But if we're seeing um, probably all the likes. <laughs> like, yeah. Like there's yeah. such a competition for being the most popular. How many followers you have, many likes you've gotten. I highly recommend, especially if you're underage, to have a private account. It's a visual diary for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's what like most people want to do, especially on Facebook and Instagram, is yeah. document. To yeah. be able to look back and be like, oh, like yeah. this is my life. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, hey, so asking you, what is the appeal for our students? Why, what are they getting out of it? What do they like about using this chat? You feel free to answer out loud or in the chat. Okay, so I'm getting a couple of different answers. And I have lost you. Hopefully you haven't lost me. Let me 
try and get back onto this chat here. Okay. Yes, some great answers coming through the chat. Personal connection, social validation, um, stuff they like, love, fear of missing out, self-representation. Absolutely. So for me, Instagram is about stories, right? Our students are already envisioning and seeing their lives through that lens. So they'll do something worth sharing or anticipate what they think is about to happen, and they'll think photo or video. And if their creative capacities are already working this way, I like to use that to help them process information from my class. So here's an example of an assignment that I give in my adolescent development class. It says people in different cultures experience adolescence differently. For this assignment, I want you to research what adolescence is like for someone in a culture different than your own. After doing some research, Create a minimum of 10 Instagram posts that can reflect adolescence in another culture. Now, not every student has access to um, Instagram or has an Instagram. So what I have done, and I'm putting this link in the chat here, is created a template that looks like an Instagram post, but isn't. And you'll see those um, in some student work in the next slide. So again, students were asked to research adolescence in a different culture and create 10 posts from an adolescent in that culture. The work I'm gonna show is from a young lady who chose to do a lady in an Amish community. Oh, the irony there, right? So she says, my name is Claire, I'm 14 years old. I live in Lancaster. She talks about the family structure. She has six brothers and sisters. My last day of school, having completed eighth grade, I'm considered educated and will stay home to help my mom now. Like many Amish, my family is obsessed with slow pitch softball. She talks about rum springa. She talks about the courting process and then 22 and getting married. Other ways this assignment can be used is I've used it to teach the research process. I once gave instructions that said, imagine that you are Jean Piaget at home with your children. Create a series of 10 Instagram posts of moments that helped contribute to your theory of child development. For English teachers, I've um, heard of them asking kids to create an account for a character in a book and to create posts for each chapter as the character moves through their story. History teachers asking students to create an account for a historical figure, or foreign language teachers asking kids to create an account that they can use to travel through the country of a language that they are learning. So a question's up in the chat. Do you, um, we, they create a Snapchat channel and they have to make at least me a friend. And it can be a private channel with just me and that student. We can also create a classroom channel where things are getting shared um, that way. So any ideas for how you could use Instagram in your classroom now that you've seen a couple of the ways that English teachers and a psychology teacher and a science teacher have used it? Ellen is asking uh, the largest class I've used these in. I had a statistics class uh, with 125 students and I used it in that class. So any other ideas? People that had a brain spark while you were reading through these or seeing these, how you could use this to teach your own subject? Chris, uh, I was just gonna talk because it's probably easier than typing, is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I do a stats class and at the end I have them take a big, for the pandemic now because we can't collect data, I have them take a big class data set and come up with a hypothesis and write it up. Yeah. And I told them to do a multimedia presentation in the past where they're just like videoing themselves, but I think this Instagram thing might be a really cool idea. So 
Yeah. Um, tell us your hypothesis and your findings and give us the plots and you can only have like five posts. I think that would be really cool. That would be cool. I think they'd really enjoy that. Thank you. Other thoughts? Good, we have so many platforms to get through and so little time. So we will go ahead and move on with that. Let's talk next about Twitter. So Twitter is a social media site that lets you post messages called tweets. These can be up to 280 characters long. You can also send private messages and post pictures and videos. You can also live stream on Twitter there are 145 million active users a day on Twitter. And when we use Twitter, it's important to keep our interaction short as the average Twitter session is just 3.39 minutes. Interestingly, the ratio of female to male users is roughly one to two. Okay, 66% male users to 34% female users. So again, I have, um, in my classes, I create a classroom Twitter account. I'm going to paste in the chat the instructions for how to do that for you to look at later. So Twitter is great for having students have to think through a concept and then summarize it succinctly. The 280 character rule is a great way to challenge students to be succinct in what they learn. So I use Twitter for things like an entry or an ex exit ticket. So say that they had two readings coming into class. I'll say when they first sit down, send a tweet to, to the class Twitter account summarizing the readings for today. And again, they have to do that in 280 characters. I've done the opposite as an exit ticket. Go to the class Twitter account and describe Albert Bandura's social learning theory. Okay, so both are ways that I can get a really quick uh, take on how well students are understanding and processing either what they read and even if they did the readings or, um, or what we did in class that day. Now let's talk about how I use hashtags. Hashtags help to categorize and classify tweets. So if I wrote a tweet about my talk today, I could put the hashtags, uh, hashtag T4L or hashtag teach. So for example, I use hashtags, um, again, say I had three reading assignments assigned for the day. I might ask my students to come in and find the common theme between them and sum it up in a hashtag. So let's try that. Say these were the titles to three articles you were assigned to read before this presentation today. How would you tie them all together? What hashtag would you use to find the common theme among them? I'm gonna give you a minute to read and think about that and put your hashtags in the chat. Good, social media impact, social media wins, social learning, very nice. And hopefully this is what our students would do, it is be able to take the three things and assimilate them, accommodate them into one common phrase, social learning, learning through tech. I use Twitter for video quizzes. Rather than asking students to fill out a worksheet or take a quiz to prove to me that they watched a video, I assign them to send a designated number of tweets while they watch. I do this whether the video is homework or whether we're watching it in class. The number of tweets that they need to do is kind of dependent about how long the video is. I like to do about one tweet every two minutes. So let's try it. I'm going to play a 90 second clip of a TED talk about attention, which is so fitting given uh, Jim Lang's presentation earlier today. And while you watch, I want you to send one tweet complete with a hashtag that includes a new concept that you learned, a new vocabulary word that you found out about, um, something um, interesting to you about the talk. So uh, about 90 seconds of a talk, send one tweet complete with hashtag while you watch. <laughs> Hey, 
paying close attention to something. Not that easy, is it? It's because our attention is pulled in so many different directions at the time. And it's in fact pretty impressive if you can stay focused. Many people think that attention is all about what we are focusing on, but it's also about what information our brain is trying to filter them out. There are two ways you direct your attention. First, there's over attention. In over attention, you move your eyes or something in order to pay attention to it. Then there's covert attention. In covert attention, you pay attention to something, but without moving your eyes. Think of driving for a second. Your over attention, your direction of the eyes are in front, but that's your covert attention, which is constantly scanning the surrounding area where you don't actually look at it. All right, so that was about 90 seconds of a talk. I'm seeing some short attention span. Maybe someone was done listening after 90 seconds. Never heard of over attention. Attention is all about how our brains filter. Hashtag intentional attention, good. Attention includes focus and filtering out extraneous info. Hashtag squirrel. Yes, why you never see women wearing sneakers on TED Talks. There we go. So this is a way um, for me to get students to pay attention to a video and not just pay attention as in have their eyes looking at the screen, but processing what they're seeing, right? There's also been a, um, a, a subtle underlying competition about the hashtags, right? Trying to get the laugh, trying to um, tie them and trying to be the most clever. So they're uh, watching the video, they're processing the information and then pushing it back out again. I also use Twitter for vocabulary and concept application. Here's an assignment for my child development class. In my child development class, we spend a week talking about gender development. And during that week, students are given this assignment. It says, today your assignment is to curl up on the couch, turn on Netflix and log into Twitter. Seriously. Watch an episode, a television show aimed at children, or watch 25 minutes of an animated movie. Using the chart on page 160 of your book, create a tweet for 10 gender stereotypes that you see in the show. Hashtag the stereotype. So they have a list of stereotypes. And this is a chart on the side of the textbook that I believe typically would just get overlooked, right? They would just skim right past that. Now they're gonna open up to that page be reading these and looking for real world examples that they see in the movies. And here are some that I've gotten back. A student watching The Lion King wrote, why is Sarabi not fighting Scar and sitting on the throne? Hashtag queens can rule too. Hashtag not ambitious. Aladdin, Jazz, what are you wearing? Hashtag revealing. Hashtag little kids are watching. Hashtag so skinny. Hashtag attractive. Rapunzel, I can't believe how quickly her mother got angry. Hashtag emotional. All of the men in the tavern are really scary looking, hashtag tough. And Superman, Clark, tell her how you feel, hashtag guys can be sensitive to, hashtag not affectionate. So it's a great way for them to apply a list of vocabulary words, a list of concepts to um, the things that they're seeing in their everyday life. Other ideas about Twitter. Someone is asking in the chat, Ellen, if I grade these. Um, I grade these um, for completion. So if I ask for 10 um, tweets to show that they watch the movie, they will get a 10 if there are 10 substantive tweets that um, show me that they were involved in watching the video. Um, I'm not gonna uh, grade them on cleverness or ability to make me laugh or, um, or ability to, be, to go viral, right? Just that they did it, that they thought about it, that they processed it. Five minutes, Chris. Thank you. Other ways um, to use Twitter include scavenger hunts, which I see Rachel brought up in the chat. So you have students be able to go from um, tweet to uh, hashtag to hashtag tracking information. Let's move on to YouTube today. This will probably be the last 
um, one that we're able to talk about. There is a constant stream of challenges and fads coming and going on YouTube. One that I use in my classes a lot is called Draw My Life. These videos began when YouTuber and Irish musician Bree drew his autobiography and posted it on YouTube. Since then, it has been watched nearly 6 million times. Other celebrities jumped on board and before long, the cool thing to do was to make a Draw My Life video. Here's a brief example of Draw My Life video somebody made for Harry Potter. Hi, my name is Harry Potter. And since all of you requested this, here is my Draw My Life. Well, it all started out pretty bad. As a baby, I lost mom and dad. See, the dark look of Voldemort wanted me dead, or I'd grow up to kill him instead. Okay, so I took this challenge that is on YouTube and changed it a little bit and said, choose a developmental theory that you want to work with. It could be Freud, Erickson, Piaget, Vygotsky. Using a whiteboard, pencil and paper, or a program found online, draw a picture of your life that illustrates each stage in the theorist's model. You are not being graded on artistic ability, but on how well each of your stories and pictures lines up with the stage of development being talked about. So here's an example of student work. Hi, my name is Alyssa, and this is Draw My Life with Eric Erickson. The first stage is trust versus mistrust. During this stage, I learned to trust my parents that they would meet my needs. Um, they would comfort me whenever I was crying, they would feed me, change my diapers, and then doing all these things for me in turn helped me learn how to trust them. The second stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. A big thing that happened to me during this stage was I learned how to go to the potty. So I got potty trained, um, I was able to walk around on my own. And another thing that happened to me was um, instead of sleeping in a crib in my parents' room, they switched me over to the room right next to them and upgraded me to the bed. The third stage is initiative versus guilt. During this stage, I began attending preschool. Um, I began making friends and engaging with my peers a lot more. And one thing I remember I loved doing with my friends was playing house. And when we would play house, we would always pretend to be sisters. And depending on who was initiating, I'd be the older sister, we'd be twins, I'd be the baby sister. And we would also do house things like cooking. So that gives you an idea of what I see. Other YouTube challenges that I have used um, in class include the challenge, say anything. This is great for test reviews. You need a minimum of two people and this is a great one to play in the class. So the goal is to say any word when it's your turn to speak, as long as you don't repeat a word someone has already said in that round. So for example, I use this when I assign them to learn about the famous marshmallow experiment in developmental psychology. We play this game as an icebreaker. They come into class. I say, we're going to play say anything about the marshmallow experiment. Then we start with someone and they say the word marshmallow. The next person can say anything else about the experiment except the word marshmallow. So they might say, wait. The third person might say, patience and on and on we go um, until we run out of words and ways to describe the challenge. Uh, there are other challenges to look into, including the whisper challenge, which is fun as well. Uh, we have just scratched the surface of how to use social media in our classrooms. There are literally dozens of other apps that would be appropriate and fun to use, including TikTok, LinkedIn, Tumblr, Reddit, and Pinterest. As we adapt, these apps have become an integral part of our students' lives outside of the classroom, and I believe we can use them inside the classroom to increase student attention, engagement, and learning. I just want to end with one quick quote from Marcel Just. He says, processing print isn't something the human brain was built for. The printed word is a human artifact. It's very convenient and it's worked very well for us for 5,000 years, but it's an invention of human beings. By contrast, mother nature has built into our brain our ability to see the visual world and interpret it. I think it's inevitable that visual media are going to become more important in conveying ideas. Thank you so much, Chris.
I love using social media. I've actually used Twitter in one of my classes and it's, it's always so much fun. All right. That concludes this session and everyone can move on to the next one. Have a great one. Thank you.